After spending hundreds of dollars to get Detroit pizza sent straight to my door and going through 20 attempts to perfect this recipe, I want to show you a Detroit pizza that anyone could make and can help hit protein goals no matter who you are. I'll also show you a secret ingredient and low key technique that will take your Detroit pizza to another level. Let's get into it. The dough always needs the most time to relax and build flavor, so that's where we'll start. I wanted to make this dough as easy as possible, so even the first time pizza maker can make this with confidence. All we need is a bowl and a spoon. Into the bowl, we are going to add 240 grams AP flour, 80 grams vital wheat gluten, 5 grams salt, and 3 grams yeast. These ingredients will make two pizza doughs, so you don't have to worry about dinner for at least the next couple days. Each pizza fits perfectly into a 8x10 inch Lloyd pan, which we will cover later, but the pan isn't the only thing that will create the best DSP or Detroit style pizza. The thickness of the pizza has to be on point too, and I have never tried authentic Detroit pizza from Michigan. Since it would be blasphemy to not try the real thing when making a Detroit pizza, I ordered buddies to see what DSP was all about. They only sent me one pizza. I ordered three. <laughs> I paid a hundred some dollars for three pizzas. They sent me one pizza. After cooking one up, it was time to do what I do best, eat. I got my buddies, which I'm not gonna lie, does not look too appetizing. Let's try the sauce first. Okay, the sauce tastes like straight black pepper. I, I've never tasted black pepper in a pizza sauce before. This tastes like something I've had before and not in a good way. Oh my God. This literally tastes like the cafeteria pizza day when you get like your little hot lunch. All the ingredients seem very cheap. Bold statement, I would rather have Domino's over this. At least with Domino's, you have that garlic crust. I have two more of these. What am I gonna do? <laughs> Mine is so much better. And lower calorie. And tastes better. And everything better. This couldn't be what all the hype was about. I refused to believe it. So what did I do? I went right back online and ordered another popular pizza spot, Detroit Style Pizza Company. They sent me in the wrong order. But we have them, at least. After it was delivered to my door, I cranked up the oven, and soon after, you know it, I was eating. Just based off the looks, I think this is gonna be 10 times better. The browning on the crust is there. I got the authentic experience without going there. Buddy's was supposed to be brown from what I understand, but it wasn't at all. I like this sauce 10 times better than Buddy's. Buddy's was just black pepper. Crunch is there. Cheese pull is there. Buddy's was like a 2.4 out of 10. This is like 7.8 out of 10. Way better. Compared to mine, my sauce definitely needs more seasoning. It just has tomatoes and salt. It needs more. Knowing the thickness of the dough, we can finish it off. Whisk all the ingredients together to combine. Then add 225 grams of water and start mixing with a spoon. Keep mixing until the spoon is giving you a hard time. Then get your hand soaked in water and incorporate all the dry ingredients into the dough by pushing into it, flipping it onto itself, and repeating. If the dough starts to stick to your hand, just wet it again and keep folding and pushing. It should look like this once you are done. To avoid having to knead the dough, aka put in the least work possible, we need to give it time. Cover with a lid and give the dough 20 minutes to relax. 20 minutes later, we will give this dough a stretch and fold by wetting our hands to avoid stickage. Pull up one side of the dough as far as possible and lay it over itself. Then we will turn the bowl 90 degrees and stretch again. Repeat for all sides of the dough. You will notice the dough is getting more tense, aka won't stretch as much with each pull, and that means everything is going as it should. Flip the dough over and using the side of the bowl, round the dough into a ball. Cover again for 20 minutes and by that time, your dough should have gassed up a bit, so repeat the same stretch and fold process. At this point, the dough has built a ton of strength and even more gluten formation will happen in the fridge. We will split this dough into two roughly 275 gram pieces and flatten each out. Bring all of the corners of the dough into the middle and flip the dough ball over. 
We will then do a little pull and turn action, letting the friction of the counter make this into a ball. Pull in towards your body and turn. Pull and turn. Pull, pull and turn, turn. Repeat for the other dough. Grab two high-sided containers, lightly spray them with oil, and add a dough ball to each. And listen, if you need to eat today, you can cover with a lid, let it rise for 90 minutes, and follow the rest of the recipe to get everything else prepped. Don't get me wrong, it will still be a great pizza, but you came for Flavor Town. So for everyone with time on their hands, cover with a lid and put in the fridge for 24 to 96 hours. The more hours in the fridge, the more flavor your dough will build. Now, this isn't necessary, but if you are going to wait more than 24 hours, I would do a stretch and fold the next day. This will not only build more strength in the dough, but it prevents it from popping out of the container, which it definitely has done before. Then simply put it back in the container and refrigerate. Great sauce starts with a can of quality crushed tomatoes. However, using this specific can wasn't my go-to initially. Since making my Lumalnati's deep dish pizza, I have become extremely fond of tomatoes that are only sold in 10 pound cans. Why? They are sweeter, need very few, if any, ingredients to make a good pizza sauce, and are easy to freeze so no sauce is ever wasted. However, after trying two authentic DSPs, I knew this sauce was too sweet for an authentic taste and finally gave up on using it in the final recipe. Instead, I used my taste buds, eyes, and the ingredient list from the website to figure out what ingredients I wanted to use. Since we are cooking our sauce, let's add 10 grams of olive oil to a preheated pot on medium heat. A high quality olive oil is equally important as high quality tomatoes to make a fantastic tasting pizza sauce and that's where today's video sponsor, Graza, comes in to save the day. Olive oil is one of the few oils that not only adds healthy fats to any dish, but a ton of flavor too. However, that flavor could be non-existent if the olive oil was made years ago and has been sitting on a shelf. Oh my god, it's just been like sitting here for like ever, bro. Graza labels each bottle of olive oil with the harvest date of their olives, which are picked at peak ripeness, along with when it was bottled and its best by date. This ensures you are getting the best tasting olive oil every time you use it. Graza's olive oil comes in two bottles, each having their own use. The first, Sizzle, is perfect for cooking, like in today's pizza sauce. The second, Drizzle, is designed to be used to finish a dish, in a dressing, or added to a dip. For example, a squeeze of drizzle, grated parmesan, and protein breadsticks made from today's pizza dough culminated in an easy and delicious protein snack. So if you want the highest quality olive oil at an affordable everyday price, click the link in the description or use code E4CM and get $5 off on your first Graza duo of sizzle and drizzle. So we'll wait about 30 seconds while our Graza olive oil heats up and then add in 8 grams of minced garlic and stir. Most DSPs just use garlic powder in their sauce, but I think having fresh garlic amps up the flavor even further. But garlic powder won't be forgotten. After about 20 seconds, add in a combination of 1 gram dried oregano and a half gram of dried basil and mix so the oil soaks up the seasonings. What we are doing here is blooming the seasonings or bringing out as much flavor as possible from them. What we don't want to do though is burn them, so after 10 seconds, add in our crushed tomatoes and give everything a mix. Finish the sauce off with a half gram of black pepper, one gram of garlic powder, and four grams of salt, and stir to combine. Something about the combination of fresh garlic and garlic powder brought an interesting flavor to the sauce I really enjoy that keeps the authentic ingredients from Detroit in the sauce at the same time. Once the sauce starts bubbling in the pot, let's give everything a mix, turn the stove down to low, and partially cover the sauce. This will block splatters of tomato from making a mess while still letting the steam escape. We'll cook this sauce down for about 15 minutes or until it leaves a path that slowly fills back in when you glide a spatula across the bottom. I don't know why, but watching this is so satisfying. I tried not cooking this sauce the first 5-10 to 10 times I made this recipe, but I noticed it leaves a lot of leftover water on the top of the pizza once cooked and cut. Which means the water seeps into the dough and crust, taking away the crispness that is the hallmark of a true DSP. After the sauce has cooled, we'll add it to a container, date it, and throw it in the fridge. I would recommend making the sauce either the same day or day before you are actually making a pizza so you have more days of making pizzas before it goes bad. However, you can always put it in the freezer if you know you won't use it for a while. Just refrigerate 24 hours before you need it and it will be ready to go the next day. 
About two to six hours before you want to cook, grab your pan of choice. I bit the bullet and bought two of these bitches. Two Lloyd pans, which I'm very happy I did. It helped me make the best crust and caramelized cheese edges that I couldn't quite get with the brownie pan or glassware that I tried. Oh, I can't even handle it. Look how fucking beautiful that is. If you want to check out the Lloyd pans or anything else that I use in this video, you can check out the links in the description below. If trying to make this pizza with whatever you have in the house, just make sure it is an 8x8 incher or close to it so you can get a somewhat similar thickness to the dough. We will then grab a secret ingredient to both help the pizza not stick as much, but also make the dough more easily spreadable. Crisco. With just 1.5 grams of Crisco, we can cover the entire pan and ensure a crispy, brown crust once finished. Plop our dough onto the pan, cover with a lid or saran wrap, and let the dough warm up for one to two hours. This will help it relax so it spreads more easily in the pan. Oh shit, like this video. After one hour, this is what we look like. I like to spray a little oil on my hands, then using the tips of my fingers, spread the dough edge to edge. This will help keep nice air bubbles spread throughout the dough. And this is where the Crisco comes in clutch because the dough spreads out much easier since it isn't as slippery as oil. With oil, I would have to let the dough relax for another 15 to 20 minutes to be able to spread it edge to edge, whereas with Crisco, I can get it all done in two minutes and cover. I would say almost as important as the pan we cook the pizza in is the cheese we use in said pan. I knew I would use some fat-free mozzarella to help lower the calories, and fat-free cheese doesn't have much flavor. However, in early test runs, I wanted to figure out if there was a difference in taste between pizzas made with part skim mozzarella versus brick cheese. And in the first test, we had to go raw. I've had brick cheese before, been to Wisconsin a shit ton of times growing up, but I haven't had brick cheese on its own in probably like 10 years or so. A little twinge of like tanginess with the mozzarella, but you know, mozzarella is mozzarella. I've had so much of it over the last few years making all these pizzas. You could definitely tell the mouthfeel of the extra fat that's in it. It's definitely a subtle difference. I don't think that it's crazy if you have to use mozzarella because you can't get brick cheese or you don't want to pay for it on Amazon. I totally understand. We'll see when we try the actual pizza itself. In the second test, we cooked both side by side. Oh my God, this is bubbling. As you can see, that extra fat in the brick cheese is helping the sides bubble and leads to that perfect toasting of the cheese on the sides of the pan. But how does it taste? Still has a crunch and it's been sitting here for like 10 minutes. It's almost like the mozzarella is bland at that point, even though the mozzarella definitely still has flavor, but it has less fat and it doesn't have that like tangy, sour, sharpy extra hint to it. But I think it definitely is more subtle once it's cooked. In hindsight, as I ate more and more test pizzas, the difference in taste became much more pronounced. Oh my God, I burned the shit out of my mouth. And this pizza recipe tastes completely different than any other pizza recipe I have ever made. And I have made 11 pizza recipes that are all in my cookbook along with 130 other recipes. If you want recipes early, like this Detroit pizza that cookbook owners have been making for nearly two weeks at this point, click the link in the pinned comment and use code E4CM for 10% off the cookbook. Now, was there a difference between the brick cheese I bought off Amazon and the one from Central Market? <laughs> My smooth brain didn't realize they were both the same brand, but it was still time to shred some and find out. That's so weird. They both have that tanginess, but this has more of that like, not fresh. This tastes fresh still. This is probably delivered, I don't know, this week. This one might have been delivered two months ago for all I know. I have no idea, that's wild. Now I have to see when they're cooked, if they taste different. The difference when cooked, very, very little. I can only tell because I know. If someone gave me both of these, I would have no idea. The one from the store, $9 a pound. Same brand on Amazon between the delivery charge and how much it was per pound, $17 per pound. So definitely try to get your brick cheese at the grocery store if you can. But even if you can't, I feel like you have to at least experience the brick cheese once and it's worth ordering. Back to the dough. 
It has been sitting in my microwave for about three hours because that is the warmest spot in my kitchen. The lovely thing about this dough is the longer the time it has to rise, essentially the better. So go do whatever you want for two to six hours after you have stretched out the dough and you will come back to a dough that is thick, airy, supple, and ready to be thrown in the oven. By the way, if you are hangry, you can most certainly cook the pizza after you initially stretch it out. There just won't be as great of a rise. You aren't yourself when you're hungry, so eat some pizza ASAP. Regardless of which you choose, throw the dough in a preheated 500 degree oven for six to eight minutes to parbake the dough. Parbaking the dough made a world of difference in the testing process. Yeah, look how much better the one that was parbaked is browned on the better tooth. If you want a true DSP that is about an inch thick all the way across, I would parbake, but hey, some people like a dough that is more dense, and you can do that as well without a parbake. Either way you cook it, we will meet at this step. Grab a plate because we need our toppings ready to go as soon as the pizza comes out of the oven. Why? The pizza starts deflating as soon as it comes out, and if we wait too long, the dough will end up denser like the non-parbaked dough. The classic topping for a Detroit pizza is pepperoni, so first on the plate comes 42 grams of turkey pepperoni. We will follow that up with 84 grams of shredded fat-free mozzarella and 98 grams of brick cheese. Once the parbake is finished, we'll spread one layer of turkey pepperoni across the pizza. Then comes our cheese. We want to make sure the fat-free cheese comes first and is evenly spread out. We will follow up with the brick cheese, making sure it is also evenly spread out and touching the edges of the pan so we get that signature crispy cheese and crust combination that Detroit pizza is known for. Lastly, if you have any brain cells, unlike me, you will put the sauce on before it goes in the oven. Forgot to add the sauce, you fucking idiot. This will come in four dollops, totaling 90 grams. And I tried two streaks and six dollops in my testing, but I like the contrast of mostly cheese in one bite, then mostly sauce in another, followed lastly by a bite with an even amount of cheese and sauce. Oh, and we can't forget the crust bite. The texture and flavor variety in this pizza is just something you can't get with any other pizza. Once topped, let's throw our DSP back in the oven for 8 to 12 minutes or until the cheese is browned to your preference. I mean, what are we even talking about here? Even with me forgetting about the sauce for almost two minutes, because I'm an idiot, this pizza looks absolutely stunning. But we have one more secret trick to make this even crispier. First, we gotta get it out of the pan and onto a wire rack. Then we will use a pizza peel or cookie sheet and add the pizza back onto a pizza steel. If you don't have a pizza steel yet, there probably isn't a kitchen appliance I would recommend more than it. I mean, let's put aside the fact that it makes great pizzas while also achieving a crispy crust that you can't get in a home oven otherwise. It helps cook food faster and more evenly, reheats frozen entrees like my pizza pot pie in just minutes, and will literally last you a lifetime. For $70, you can make 16-inch pizzas and get the best tasting pizzas you will ever cook in your home oven. In fact, I can make an entire video on why a pizza steel should be in every household. After two minutes, the bottom is all crisped up. Just listen. Just listen. After we get it out of the oven, we want to cut it right away, and I am using a cutting board to do so. Get it right back on the wire rack to cool for a few minutes before crunching in. This pizza is great for people who are cutting and like to save their calories for the end of the day like I do, or for people that need to bulk up and eat some higher calorie meals, or people that have trouble hitting their protein goals because this one is loaded with over 100 grams. Pizza and wings are a deadly combination and when used in tandem can create an easy to sustain weight loss diet. In this video here, I make a Wingstop combo meal prep for just 600 calories that includes homemade buffalo sauce, wings, and fries that take you straight to Weight Loss Boulevard in Flavortown. I'll see you there. Until next time, deuces.